Okie dokie. Good evening, everyone. I am here talking about uncommon causes of peripheral neuropathy. I am Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight we're talking about these uncommon causes of peripheral neuropathy. So without further ado, let me go to present from beginning. Um, for those of you on Facebook, you can watch me on YouTube with the PowerPoint screen and screen presentation. First, it's important to say, what is peripheral neuropathy? Peripheral neuropathy refers to, in general, what is called a distal symmetric polyneuropathy, i.e., the nerves are generally dying and degenerating for all intents and purposes, typically farthest away from the brain and the heart, i.e. your feet, and then it can progress up to the knees, and then ultimately it can affect the hands and spread more proximally. That's the generality. <clears throat> are there exceptions? 100%. Uh, there are at least 80 to over 100 causes of peripheral neuropathy. Tonight I'm discussing a few subsets of the uncommon ones. But yeah, that's the generality with peripheral neuropathy. We call it a stocking and glove distribution. So think if you're wearing kind of those long socks that they used to wear back in the 70s and then some gloves that go up the arms, that's the distribution that neuropathy patients can have affected to where they then experience numbness, tingling, burning, or weakness in those distributions. The common causes of peripheral neuropathy include diabetes. Uh, diabetes accounts for about one half of all neuropathy cases. <clears throat> Prediabetes actually accounts for about a third of the other 50% of neuropathy cases. So think of a pie chart, half of the pie is diabetes, now the other half is everything else, and maybe upwards of a third of that other half is due to prediabetes. And I'll, I may circle back to this. Gluten is another cause. Uh, it's actually pretty substantial, maybe equilibrating to another third of that other 50% that's non-diabetic. And then we have autoimmune conditions, hypothyroidism, and vitamin deficiencies. I will just say here that prediabetes has recently become acknowledged as a foremost cause of peripheral neuropathy. That work came out of the University of Utah, Dr. Singleton, Drs. Singleton and Dr. Smith, and uh, I should do another video on it. I may have done a video on it, but look into that. The key test there is the oral glucose tolerance test. And pausing on that subject, a, a reason why we're doing this talk is because so many patients with neuropathy go to their doctor, they're told they have neuropathy, they're told you have diabetes or you don't. And oftentimes the next statement I hear is that, you know, the other causes don't necessarily matter. We really don't know what to do with your condition except to maybe give you a medication to help with some of the pain if you have burning pain. So that's the overview, so to speak. So in terms of our first quote-unquote uncommon case of or uncommon cause of peripheral neuropathy, we're going to talk about monoclonal gammopathies of undetermined significance, which is a mouthful. You can call it MGUS or MGUS. MGUS stands for a group of conditions that involve the bone marrow. Now, the bone marrow in some individuals, in fact, like 3 to 4% of the population over the age of 50, will start producing abnormal proteins or abnormal immunoglobulins. And these immunoglobulins may be benign. They may attack peripheral nerve tissue. And these, this condition called MGUS can develop into other really pathological conditions uh, such as forms of bone cancer or other forms of cancer affecting uh, the hematological system, your, your production of different um, types of blood cells, and it can also involve the production of uh, what are called light chain amyloidosis types of manifestations. 
So going with it, basically you want to be aware of multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and um, light chain amyloidosis. <clears throat> So that's a mouthful, but I'm giving you this information so you can discuss it with your doctor. <clears throat> because if you have peripheral neuropathy and you're not getting answers, this may give you uh, a little more, a, a few more pieces, uh, so to speak, to discuss with them. So the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance is diagnosed via blood test. You can ask your doctor about a, a serum immunofixation, a serum protein electrophoresis, and a urinary protein electrophoresis. You can also do a urinary immunofixation. But those are the tests most commonly run to determine if you have this. Now, if you do have this and you have neuropathy, the next step most commonly is to be referred to a hematologist. A hematologist is a blood doctor, and usually these doctors will run more advanced testing, and then they're going to monitor your signs and your symptoms and make sure there's no progression of this monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance into any other conditions like I mentioned before. <clears throat> so that is important. Let me take a drink. To keep in mind, if you do have an MGUS, and I believe there's about a 1% per year transition potentially into a malignant condition like multiple myeloma or the other ones I mentioned. Now, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, oftentimes referred to as CIPN, um, is a biggie for those who work with peripheral neuropathy cases. So chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy commonly follows uh, medications like Davinka alkaloids, um, the taxanes, uh, also the thalidomide drug, which you may be aware of, um, also the like um, paclitaxel, those ones which I believe fit into the taxanes. Those are really common. Um, and the neuropathy that they create lots of times is very painful. And one of the dose limiting effects of chemo. And that's where it's been a passion of mine, and I could be better at getting it out into the world, so to speak, uh, regarding, you know, maybe if we had more doctors working with neuropathy patients from a rehabilitative perspective, maybe we could help some of these chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy cases so that they can get the treatment that they need and not have to stop their chemo because the neuropathy is so severe. Now, can I say that for sure? No, but I have worked with a few cases where I've been able to help them um, with their pain, and that was really satisfying. So what happens with the chemo is that the chemo is killing the cancer, and the chemo lots of times, as you probably well know, kills parts of our own body, and the nerves, particularly the peripheral nerves, can be very affected in that situation. Okay, heavy metal toxicity. So... Um, you know, some alternative practitioners are really into heavy metals and they'll say, you know, every condition under the sun, if you have fibromyalgia, if you have depression, if you have a thyroid problem, it's due to heavy metal toxicity. Um, heavy metal toxicity certainly has a time and a place and it certainly can cause peripheral neuropathy. Uh, some of the biggies you want to think about are mercury, lead, arsenic. Um, there are even cases of, you know, spouses putting arsenic in, in their spouse's um, food or drinks, and that can eventually be fatal, <clears throat> but it can definitely cause a peripheral neuropathy. So, uh, for example, with the lead neuropathies, oftentimes they manifest as weakness in the hands or a drop foot. Uh, particularly mercury involves a weakness pattern down in the lower extremities, and it may involve a tremor of the hands. And that's the cool thing about peripheral neuropathy is that lots of times different causes of neuropathy manifest very differently than other causes. So like a diabetic patient very rarely has weakness in their feet. They have numbness, they have tingling, they may have severe burning, but they generally don't have weakness. Whereas other forms of neuropathy that I'll talk about later that are genetic, they can have profound weakness and hardly any other symptoms. Lots of times they don't even realize they have it until they're seeing a, a neurologist for another reason and they see their legs and say, oh my gosh, you have X, Y, or Z. 
So that's important. Alcohol. Alcohol is a common cause of neuropathy. Oh, I believe it may account for about 10% of neuropathy cases, according to some statistics. Around 44% of alcoholics have signs and or symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. So if you know someone who's suffering with alcoholism, uh, if they do have you know, numbness or bad burning in their feet, there may be some options for them. Uh, one thought is that it is the ethanol within the alcohol that is toxic to the nerves. And that seems to play a role in the well-nourished alcoholics. And the well-nourished alcoholics, there is some thought in the literature that they develop more of the small fiber peripheral neuropathy sensations where their feet are just burning um, incessantly and it's very, very painful. And then there's the under or malnourished alcoholic patient who is mainly like drinking their lunch, so to speak, and they have a tendency to have thiamine deficiencies, that's vitamin B1, and thiamine replacement may be of some help to them. So uh, something to keep in mind if you know someone who's having numbness or tingling or burning in their feet and you think they may have a drinking problem, um, or if you have a drinking issue, then these are things that may be worth looking at. Critical illness peripheral neuropathy, I think this is important because of the current situation with global health and the infection that's spreading across the world. In 2019, 2020, 2021, and who knows how long it will go, <clears throat> but in essence, this infection is leading to more and more people being on a ventilator. And if you go on a ventilator and you're having trouble getting off a ventilator, independent of the infection I just mentioned, but those who have trouble getting off ventilators lots of times have critical illness myopathy or critical illness um, peripheral neuropathy, which they may refer to as a critical illness polyneuromyopathy. And you know, your nerves and your muscles are very metabolically active. And if you're critically ill and you're on a ventilator, you may not be perfusing enough oxygen, it's thought, or there may just be so much inflammation that it can be damaging to the nerves. Uh, this is an often overlooked issue in the ICU. Why? Because it's not completely life-threatening, so to speak, if your feet are numb and you have some weakness coming out of being on a ventilator or being severely ill. But it is something to keep in mind if you don't know what caused your neuropathy, but then you think back, oh, I was in the ICU, and then I developed these symptoms. That's important. Viral infections are also very important to look at. Hepatitis C virus can cause peripheral neuropathy. Liver and kidney problems can cause peripheral neuropathy independent of the viral infections. HIV can cause neuropathy. So for any neurologist doing a thorough workup, on neuropathy cases, looking at hepatitis and other viral infections can be really important. Genetics is another feature. So the condition I mentioned before with Charcot-Marie-Tooth, I didn't say that word, but Charcot-Marie-Tooth is, I believe, the most common genetic form of neuropathy. It has many different types, and there are a lot of different mutations that can cause Charcot-Marie-Tooth also known as CMT. And I believe there's over 50 different mutations identified at this point in time that can cause this form of neuropathy. They typically present with what is referred to as a stork-legged appearance and or a soccer ball foot or a, a concrete soccer ball foot, meaning their legs are really skinny down below the knees and they have a very, very high arch, a pes cavus, such that it looks like they kicked a concrete soccer ball for their foot to be having such a high arch and to be almost kind of deformed and how it's it's not of normal length, so to speak, uh, proportionally. So charcot marie tooth is important to consider, especially if you see a lot of atrophy below the knees. And um, this is why it's important with any case of neuropathy to ask, hey, did your mom have neuropathy? Did your grandfather have neuropathy? Did they have skinny legs? Did they have weakness? Because, you know, individuals back in the 50s may have not been diagnosed with neuropathy, but uh, they had those other features of weakness or muscle shrinking. Immune causes. Actually, and going back up to genetics, also important to consider what's called spinocerebellar atrophy. Spinocerebellar different types of what's called SCA can present with 
peripheral neuropathy too, so important. And Charcot Marie Tooth is not the only form of genetic neuropathies. There's Desjardins sodas, there's all these other um, forms of genetic neuropathies that we want to be aware of. Also, metabolic storage diseases like Tangier's disease, and where the body may lack a certain enzyme to process certain fatty acids, that can result in neuropathy. Immune forms of neuropathy, aside from the autoimmune ones, which you want to think any rheumatological condition, such as rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, um, lupus, um, I mentioned gluten earlier, um, Hashimoto's, I believe fits into the disimmune forms of neuropathy, and scleroderma can fit into um, those autoimmune patterns with peripheral neuropathy. So in the literature, lots of times I'll just say disimmune, but the autoimmune conditions that I mentioned before can be associated with peripheral neuropathy. And then we want to think chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy, referred to as CIDP. Now, CIDP is the chronic form of Guillain-Barre. Um, let me back up. So you can have what's called an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy, known as Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's where individuals all of a sudden, they may have some burning pain down in their lower extremities, but they have a lot of weakness. And when doctors evaluate them, they see more of a weakness pattern or a muscle involvement pattern. And they may need a ventilator. They may need plasma apheresis because the neuropathy can affect all of their peripheral nerves, even the peripheral nerves affecting their respiratory function. So Guillain-Barre can be a life-threatening condition. It can transition into the chronic form, known as chronic inflammatory demyelinating radiculopathy once someone is largely healed, or other cases of where someone doesn't have Guillain-Barre, but they develop chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy, which is basically the myelin covering the nerves, uh, the myelin sheath, is being attacked by the immune system. It's almost like the peripheral nervous system variant of multiple sclerosis. It's not multiple sclerosis, but it's analogous. So the myelin sheaths are attacked in these chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy patients will have certain presentations on nerve conduction velocity and EMG testing. And that's the testing, the electrodiagnostic testing doctors use to see how fast nerves are transmitting signals and if the muscles are dying because of lack of nerve innervation. And so CIDP is also important to keep in mind uh, for anyone who's working with neuropathy or if you have neuropathy and you don't have an answer. So are there other forms of uncommon neuropathies? Yes, uh, these are the ones I put together you know, in a short period of time, within 45 minutes. Uh, again, peripheral neuropathy is a very complicated subject, and I could talk about each one of these for an hour. Um, but trying to distill it down, I hope this is helpful. If you have a form of neuropathy that you're questioning, uh, send me a comment, and I'll try and do a video on it. And otherwise, I hope this was helpful, and I hope that you all have a lovely Tuesday evening. Okay. Have a good night and we will talk to you soon.